Well, we're in the middle of a lockout, but leave it to the Mets to give us something to talk about. I'm bringing in Todd Radom, and we're going to unpack this onion. Is that an expression? It is now on Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. As you can tell right there from my lower third, please, please, I'm begging you, call me Sully. Today's episode, which in some ways is an emergency episode, even though we had already planned to do it, which is being dropped on the 18th day of December 2021. Better get your shopping in soon and no better person to bring in to talk about your holiday shopping than my guest today because he has a bunch of books which would fit perfectly in your stocking, under the tree, or just thrown across the room however you celebrate your holidays. Mr. Todd Radom is going to be here. Great artist, great graphic designer, great author, and great baseball pundit that's right i'm calling him a baseball pundit this show is available on youtube you're watching me right now we're available in your earbuds on all your podcasting platforms hey thanks for making lockdown mlb your first listen we're available for free on all the podcasting platforms and if you have a smart device be sure to tell it to play podcast lockdown mlb or check out some of the other great shows on the lockdown podcast network including lockdown bets with your boy q and fantasy predictions from your Lee Sterling. But hey, oh, by the way, follow us on Twitter at Lockdown MLB Pods. Same handle for Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. Look right there. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Ah, got all that out of the way. You know what? I could give a big, big build up, a big ramp up. But do you know what? Sometimes you don't need the walk up music. Sometimes you don't need the build up. Sometimes you can just say, ladies and gentlemen, Todd Radom. There you are. A pundit. A pundit. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm also, I, I'm soften sometimes at a loss how to describe who I am and what I do, but I will include that going forward, and I appreciate it, Sully. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you are a, a designer of many, of, of many beautiful uh, of, of logos, of posters, of art, the all-star game postseason design uniforms themselves you know great pieces of artwork regarding the sport if you've seen any baseball artwork over the last bunch of years chances are you've seen a ratum you've seen a ratum and you've got a bunch of books including winning ugly that could uh, be perfect wrapped and put underneath the tree right I do. I mean, you know, we're getting close here, my friend. Christmas being a, a week away for those who celebrate. But yes, winning ugly, my uh, air quotes, as I always say, loving homage to some of the most questionable uniforms in the history of baseball and fabric of the game, which mm-hmm. talks about the uh, stories behind the names and looks of every NHL franchise that ever took the ice. Yeah, and by the way, I, I think I said this to you before on a previous episode. This is not locked on NHL, but I do believe you can make an argument that the most, one of the best names in, if you consider the four, four major sports, NBA, NHL, NBA, and Major League Baseball, the name the New Jersey Devils is great because of the legend of the New Jersey Devil in the New Jersey swamps, which is right around the place where the Brendan Byrne Arena was when they moved the hockey Colorado Rockies to the Meadowlands to call them the New Jersey Devils, which has a name that sounds great if you know nothing about it. But when you find out it has folklore behind it, it like it, it works on so many levels. And I love names like that, that aren't just random names, that it's that it has a tie to the actual location where it's at. Yeah, I totally agree, and it's one of those names that doesn't have to try too hard. It's not two names. It's not footwear like the Red Sox or White Sox as much as we might love them. But Mm -hmm. uh, it has immediate impact and local resonance, and it's easy to pronounce. It lends itself to great imagery, and uh, you add to that the fact that they've won some Stanley Cups out there in the swamp. 
Yeah. Now they play in Newark, and yeah, you're totally right. Um, remember that player was it Miroslav Shatan who played for yes. Buffalo, and his name was pronounced S or his name was spelled S A T A N. Why the Devils didn't trade for him? That you have a devil shirt with looks like Satan on the back would be the instantly the best selling jersey in the history of hockey. Hey, I'm all about marketing, doing what I do here. You know that. And uh, I would further that with uh, extending into three digits, three sixes. <laughs> and, you know, just think about how many how many jerseys you'd sell or sweaters, oh, yeah. as they say in hockey. It's the best. Um, I, look, at you and I have talked about this before, but I do want to talk about it with some of the other uh, the guests here. Um, my A lot of uniforms that have been considered ugly, uh, by you, it's usually by you know stuck up traditionalists. Um, I th- you know, I consider it to be beautiful. I love the garish uniforms that the Pirates wore in the seventies. I love I love colorful uniforms. I love uniforms that stick out. Uh, and and I think that you know some I miss the the I I love the what was it the tequila sunrise uniforms that the Astros wore. I think they're, the, those are the beautiful uniforms. Partly because I my first entry into baseball was the late seventies. So to me, that was normal. Yeah. Um, to me, what I felt the ugly, I, I am much more offended by completely forgettable uniforms than ugly uniforms. Like when the white Sox had the cursive C and just a generic white socks across their chest, who wears those? Who's remembers those? Or, or when the Padres dropped all their cool colors and they went for blue and um, and and white, and they just had a generic San Diego and Padres, or a, a parade of Rangers uniforms that are completely interchangeable. I'm more offended by those than you know the Padres wearing mustard yellow tops and bottoms with Dave Woodfield coming out looking like you know <laughs> looking what he looked like Big Bird, and it was it was it's a wonderful thing. Well. Steve Garvey famously said when he went from the Dodgers with their very austere, time-honored look to the Padres that he used to look like an American flag, and he said, and now I look like a taco. So uh, it is the Taco Bell look, but you're right, and you you mentioned the very, very forgettable late uh, 90s White Sox, uh, a team with probably more looks than any other franchise. Mm -hmm. The White Sox have pivoted. I mean, they've been very consistent now. For a Too really consistent. long period Too of consistent. time. Too consistent. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it, it's a pretty good look, I think. But um, but those but those uh, late Comiskey uniforms, let's call them, with the Campbell's Soup C. Really, very, <laughs> yeah, very generic. Yeah. Very generic. I, but by the way, I feel that the um, the Nationals uh, missed the boat when they dropped. They, they had like a practice hat that had DC on it. But they kept the Walgreens cursive W uh, because I guess all the great years they had with that. I don't know. Um, I, I loved the. I don't know if you remember they had the, the DC. Of course you remember. Well, I, I would remember that because I designed it, Sully. <laughs> I told you. Do you what? So I stepped, so I, I do remember it. Rake. I remember it I very well. On, yes. I stepped on that rake. I totally forgot you designed <laughs> that. I thought I thought it was a big fat fastball right up the middle like 90 mile an hour flat you know by the way this is how ubiquitous todd radom is in the world and that's how you know that was a legitimate compliment because i completely 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 forgot that you designed that i know well, it's a good thing stuff. you didn't say it was forgettable and vanilla and that you hated it do you know what the worst is when the nats try to have a dc you have to have the curse of <laughs> w on it Oh there's a uh, there's a story about the curse of W that I'm not sure if you're familiar with, uh, yeah, and if you're now. interested, I can I can throw it out there. Yeah, so there, there you go. This this has been discussed publicly, so it's not okay. any insider punditry information. Okay. Uh, when the city fathers of Washington announced that they had um, come to an agreement to move the Montreal Expos to D.C., this mm-hmm. is in uh, October of '04 or late right. September, right around there. An uneventful um, time for Red Sox fans. Oh, I mean, I was right in the middle of all that. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, um, 
the the city council and the mayor uh, held a press conference and they got their hands on these Washington senators Cooperstown collection caps. So they all go out there with these red caps with the cursive W of the Washington senators who had moved in 1971. And uh, this is no secret, Commissioner uh, Selig, uh, you know, kind of nostalgic for the senators, loved the name senators. He said, boy, those are great looking hats, just great looking. And who owned the Montreal Expos at that point in time? Major League Baseball, That's of right. which uh, Mr. Selig, now Commissioner Emeritus Selig, was uh, in charge. And uh, that is really the prime reason, so far as I understand, why they went to war with that cursive W. Well, there you go. Well, they should have been wearing a Radom original on top of there. <laughs> well, I did the logo. Uh, I designed the uniforms, the first generation of uniforms. Mm -hmm. and The, nat uh, the Natmals. When they yes, forgot exactly. <laughs> yes, forever known. Ryan Zimmerman. Yes. Well, there you go. Do you... Do you did it hurt that they weren't wearing those when they finally won? I mean, a rough no, song. no. I mean, you know, my my uh, the look that I mean, it was so cool. I was at the World Series in D.C. for two games, mm -hmm. and it was just so awesome to see this team that, in some small way, I was kind of there at the inception. I was there for their first home game in 2005, so uh, it was at RFK such an Stadium at RFK. Yep, at RFK yeah. Stadium. Yeah, and so uh, no, I mean, you know, listen, the looks come and go. Um, I'm sure whoever designed the very generic 80s White Sox uh, were hurt when they went to what they have now. But, you know, the, that's what it, that's what happens. All right. I'm sure before we go to our first break here, I do want to ask you this. Uh, I, I will give you my answer and then I'd like to have your answer. My least favorite uniform of my lifetime. I can't I mean, just in terms of uh, that's how I got to go. by. I mean, I'm, I can't go by how, what the Browns were wearing just in terms of me turning on a game and watching a game. My least favorite uniform of all time were the Angels when they had the blue uniforms. They had the A Angel with the with the halo wings on it. Mo Vaughn wore those uniforms when Jim Edmonds made his famous catch in center field in Kansas City was wearing those. Uh, those are my least favorite, and I am praying to the soul of my late father that you didn't design those. <laughs> no, I designed the current look that yes. replaced those. Yes. However, however, yes. Uh, I don't know if this is my least favorite uniform ever, but mm -hmm. uh, you and I are both Red Sox guys. The Red Sox road uniforms, you know, that Bill Buckner famously, uh, you know, game yeah. six, 1986, these generic, talk about vanilla, generic. I don't care if they're somewhat similar to what Ted Williams wore. Everything about them was, they look like the Yankees. Just look. It looked <laughs> cheap. It looked cheap. It looked like they just yeah. got, I mean, there was no, I mean, th when they wore their road uniforms in 75, that was, it was the same font as Red Sox, it said when it said Boston and across, or roughly, That's right. yeah, or they, they, it was an approximation at least. I'm sure yeah. I'm, I can't throw font at you. You're going to throw no, 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 no. <laughs> You're right, but right. The ones that I'm referring to were just generic block letters, mm -hmm. and at various points uh, during the time that they were worn, you had on one side very defined B O S with a giant separation that said T O N on the other side, or B O S T with a big gap and O N, which added to the um you know the crappiness if you want to look at it that way yeah and let me just tell you something when they wore those uniforms it was an absolute surefire bet that this team was going to flop when wearing those uniforms and if you're going to make any bets go to bet online it's the number one site for all your sports action this season head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use promo code locked on to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC to your favorite Las Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online is where the game starts. We're here with Todd Radom. Who the uh, was asked me if his video was frozen? Said no, no, his video was okay. frozen. His video isn't frozen, but he's really cool. That's why he felt <laughs> it was frozen. It was very cool. Just, just very well like, done. 
just kind of how coolly I smoothly went right into my uh, bet online ad read right there. Hey, um, we're not just here to talk about, I know most people tune in this to talk about the uniforms that the Angels wore in 2000, but we've got actually some news. There's actual news that's going on uh, during the middle of this ridiculous lockout. Um, and if you're if you're watching the video, you see that Todd Radom is in the Radom cave, and he is wearing, and boy, my dad would love this. He's wearing, that's a, that's, now it looks like a New York Giant hat. It is a New York Giant hat. Am I right? It's it's actually a Mets hat with some different colors. Oh, it looked like a New York. Yeah, Giant it's a hat. gold, right? Because it's a black cap. It's a black hat with the NY. That's the right. that's the, the exactly. Giants. A fashion of Mets fashion cap. Right. Well, there you go. I uh, from from the nanosecond I saw, it, I thought he was wearing a New York Giants hat. And as my father, may he rest in peace, loved his New York Giants. Uh, today, uh, Buck Showalter is continuing his pursuit to win the 1994 World Series <laughs> by signing on to join the other team in New York, the New York Metropolitans. And uh, uh, this has been an absolute surreal uh, offseason for the Mets. It's a strange year for the Mets. And there's, there's really going to be only two outcomes for this. It's going to be one of those situations where it's like the Finley A's or the Steinbrenner Yankees where it's complete and utter chaos and they win anyway, or it's going to be like the 92, 93 Mets where they make a bunch of moves, a flurry of moves, and it just turns into the Hindenburg. And I really, really don't see a middle option there. So, but tell us your thoughts of, of show. And have you interacted with show Walter in your years of uh, being a pun, a baseball pundit? I don't believe I have. Uh, I'm trying to think. I'm, I don't believe I have. But uh, but I will say that, you know, I'm a New Yorker, and New York is always better when both the Mets and Yankees are relevant. There's no question about that. And, of course, as we say, Mets going to Met at all times, uh, with the possible exception of, you know, in our lifetimes, 19... 19- 86, which was a long time ago, yeah. and in my lifetime, certainly 1969, which I don't really remember. But anyway, insofar as Buck Walter is concerned, it's probably a pretty good move. It's not the most exciting move in the world. It's not historic. It's not groundbreaking. But the, the Mets need stability right now, and Buck Walter gives uh, stability and certainly credibility. Uh, I don't think, despite his age and experience and seasoning, I don't believe that he is a guy who is not uh, going to be receptive to um, advanced metrics, which, of course, you know, managers need to be in on these days. Um, he certainly knows the media, having been a member of the media himself, a pundit, uh, of course, having managed in New York. He knows what the expectations are. So I think he's going to add uh, some some much needed stability to this franchise and to your point, Sully, yeah, I, you know, remembering the, the uh, wow, you know, 92-93, Saberhagen, Bleach, uh, Vince Coleman, Bobby Bonilla showing us the Bronx, even though the Mets were in Queens, uh, a, a lot of drama. It's going to be interesting, and to get back to what I first said, New York is always better when the Mets are interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I... I think that, I mean, this is, again, Met fans are, are horrified when I bring this up, that they're in first place for almost the entire season, and the team that winds up winning the division has the parade at the end of the year. Um, it, of course, Not the it, first time we've seen that movie, though. Think back no. to, you know, 06, 07, just horrific endings to the Mets seasons. Yeah. Uh, you know. I, I, I actually think the 06, 07 years were the great lost opportunity for the Mets franchise because the Yankees were starting to be wobbly and there was a chance. I mean, look, I love the concept of alternate universes. I really do. I think about them all the time. If this had happened, if that happened, if this franchise move had happened, if this if if this move didn't happen. I love thinking about things like that. And I can't tell you how often I've thought of that that game seven in 06 yeah. uh, where really a, a completely nondescript Cardinals team that was, you know, that was a shell of the team that was, that should have won the world series the year before the 05 team was the legit pennant contender. And this team was, I mean, 
the, the Central needed a division champion, and they happened to be the one. You know, the, the, the Reds were in contention, and they finished with a losing record. It was that kind of a year. And that Mets team, because the Yankees got eliminated early by Detroit, and they had Delgado, who was really who would have been the NLCS MVP, and would have been and was having a spectacular postseason, and was really a, a title away from becoming a a Mets legend and a New York legend. Uh, and another person was Billy Wagner, that if he was the closer on a World Series winning team, his Hall of Fame discussion would be a, I mean, he, he statistically, he's one of the great closers of all time, but he doesn't have that defining closer moment that closers seem to have to have. That's right. And, you know, it, swing if, if Beltran gets a double in the gap, that Mets team defeats that Tigers team. Beltran, uh, Delgado is a beloved New York legend. Even if he spends the bulk of his career in Toronto, he becomes a New York legend. He's you know, like Gary Carter spent the bulk of his career in uh, Montreal. He's a Mets legend. You know, that's what would have been, and, and his Hall of Fame candidacy would go through the roof. You know, Wagner's would go through the roof. And Willie Randolph would become an all-time New York baseball legend, grew up in Brooklyn, captain of the Yankees, led the Mets to the World Series title. All of these things would have fallen into the place if if that had happened. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy to think about all of it. And, you know, you talk about the Cardinals catching fire at the right time that season. Not a lot different from perhaps in a different way than the Nationals. Okay, yeah, the Nats. Right? Yeah. You know, um, and, you know, there. I have a friend of mine who has always, you know, his words always come back. Uh, the baseball season is the perfect length. It is 162 mm -hmm. games during the regular year. The sep you know, there's separation between the contenders and the pretenders at a certain mm -hmm. point. And certainly, you know, and we see this every so often, a team that just catches fire at the right time. Look at the Braves this year, um, you know, uh, g become eternal champions for us. Right. Whereas the what ifs, the, the 2006 Mets, oh, so sad. Well, and of course, there's so many what ifs that have happened with Buck Showalter's career. You know, what if the Yankees were able to hold on to that lead in game five against Seattle? Um, what would if there was no strike in 94? And what if he brought in Zach Britton? Um, you know, a couple of like a, a drop a ball here, drop the here or there against Kansas City when he was managing Baltimore. Um, you know, and, and and he loses a a bunch of two really tight games to the Mets in the in the division series when he was managing Arizona. There are a lot of times in his career where if a thing bounced this way or that, he may have had a ring or two on, on his finger. Are you talking uh, about Dusty Baker again, Sully? It's boy, if only Baker and if you know, Baker and show here's what I want. I want the NLCS to become to become between the Padres and the Mets. So we have Melvin and Showalter. <laughs> and one of them faces Baker, and it turns into the "Are they ever going to win a ring?" Uh, uh, World Series because that's, that's yeah. just, that has to happen. You know, you know, you 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 just referenced the great, great, great Game Five of the nineteen ninety five ALDS mm -hmm. Yankees. One of the Mariners. best ever. One of the best. I, ever. I was I was sitting at the bar at the Jacob Worth uh, restaurant in Boston, old German restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, re it didn't make it through the pandemic. It had been there since 1868 or something. Oh, yeah. But I remember sitting there watching that uh, and knowing that it was this, un you know, I mean, you could feel the adrenaline and not having a lot of dog in the fight necessarily. Um, it was just what a thing and saved baseball for Seattle. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? I've, I have said that, you know, uh, Griffey is my favorite non-Red Sox player of all time. And, He's never he never got to play in the World Series, but he did have his signature October moment, which is that moment when he runs from first to third to score on the Martinez double to left. And that's the one thing that we are we are missing uh, in Mike Trout, because he's now the best player today. And so far, with the exception of three games, he has played golf every single postseason <laughs> of his career. And more than anything, that's I would love to see that happen with him. But we'll see what happens with Showalter, who, again, has been a Johnny Appleseed of success wherever he's gone. 
you know, the, you know, he's won the manager of the year with multiple teams, you know, and when he leaves, the teams go to the World Series, except for Baltimore. You know, Yankees, Diamondbacks, and Rangers all went to the World Series after he left. So maybe the Mets should hire him and then immediately fire him and go to the World Series. But um, I think it's a great choice uh, because it's, you know, it, at least – it gives the Met fans something to hang on to. And they've tried with two inexperienced managers, Mickey Calloway, yikes, and Rojas, who comes from a great baseball family, but it's, uh, you know, it didn't work. It didn't yeah, work. And, and, you know, managers sometimes don't work out because maybe it wasn't their time. And right. it's so interesting to me because there are so many examples of teams who change managers and go for the polar opposite, the absolute mm -hmm. opposite. Uh, look at the Red Sox as an example, right? I mean, you know, we've had, uh, we've had everybody from, you know, when Terry Francona came aboard, I mean, talk about a guy who really was not a distinguished manager at that point had been treading, you know, had a, a good run, a good long run with the Phillies, which was marked by failure. He comes to yeah. Boston and he leaves there with the credentials to be a hall of famer, which he has only you know, uh, accumulated uh, more on top of that uh, in Cleveland. Uh, and, you know, who does he take over for? Should we even mention Grady a little? I just did. Yeah, you did. I'm sorry. But, just, but a bounce here or there in 03, and Grady Little is his beloved figure in Boston history. You know, I mean, it's that is a, true. That's, that's the ultimate. I mean, think about how beloved John McNamara would have been if one more out would be. Here's this nice Irish boy. Going to church every Sunday, you don't think he would have been uh, uh, beloved and you know from Sacramento. He's not but but Boston. here, yeah, in, in both of those cases, Dave Stapleton doesn't enter the game for defense in Game Six in 1986. And yeah, but, yeah the game was already tied. To me, it was like it was I, almost, hey, I know I, I was watching in a room full of Mets I, fans. So I, know I, I remember. Don't have to tell you, I know I don't. Oh, have to tell I know. You. And do you want? And but I guess they don't get to be beloved figures in Boston history, but they do get a consolation prize and that is i'm going to send them a box of built bars built bars are the best tasting protein bars out there now let me tell you something they've got so many great flavors to choose from whether it's mint brownie cherry double chocolate cookies and cream peanut butter brownie or my personal favorite which is raspberry i love the taste of raspberry. you get that tanginess with the chocolate it's such a good combination but you get your built box if you're built bar box say that three times fast with all nine of the great flavors coming in but we got more flavors coming in we got built bar puffs they're light they're fluffy they're marshmallowy that's not even a word that's how good they are and through and through different flavors all covered in chocolate tastes so good you won't believe that they're filled with protein and are low calorie the perfect thing especially with the holidays coming in grab yourself a built bar dunk that baby in your hot chocolate boom it's the best leave it for santa while you're at it and ask Santa for Winning Ugly by Todd Radom. But hey. Both, here, both of those things sound good. Yes, but do you know what? I'm going to make it even better. You go to built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off built.com, where you get those built bars. Okay, we're here with Todd Radom listening to me sing. Uh, visit Todd at toddradom.com that's your, your handle on twitter is at todd Radom. he really put his back into that he he spends more time designing than he does coming up with clever urls so it's you know branding it's it's, it's like branding. why confuse people why confuse yep. people branding this is coming from the guy who goes by as we we're there goes by sully baseball um <laughs> When, when it was the old Sully Baseball podcast, I was in some group where they said, how did you determine the name of your podcast? What was your process? And I said, well, my name is Sully. I talk about baseball. Meeting's over. It's, don't uh, overthink it. Don't, don't overthink, overthink it. it. The don't same thing with design, the same thing with writing. Don't overthink it. You know, you got to reduce the sauce. Now, let me just, a uh, thing I'm going to bring up with you. Todd Radom, always, when you've been on the, uh, the Baseball Tonight uh, podcast on the ESPN, which is actually other than the Locked On podcast, one of the few baseball podcasts I I, I listen to, just because I, I I like learning stuff through baseball, and I can't learn any more about baseball. But um, you often bring you often bring to the table uh, a trivia question here. Um, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna throw I'm trying my best to throw two your way. Okay, now one of the things that Todd Radom does brilliantly is he creates uh, great graphic images of classic baseball players many times when they get elected to the Hall of Fame. 
now this year, we have several new Hall of Famers from the veterans, the, a pair of veterans committee votes. But sadly, Dick Allen once again missed it by a single vote. Now, had Dick Allen been selected to be in the Hall of Fame, he would join the following players for what specific these these Hall of Famers share would have shared what specific trait in their career with Dick Allen. And they are Ty Cobb, Satchel Paige, Billy Williams, Joe Morgan, Reggie Jackson, Mike Piazza, and Frank Thomas. The name wow. again, Ty Cobb. He would have shared what specific career trait with Ty Cobb, Satchel Paige, Billy Williams, Joe Morgan, Reggie Jackson, Mike Piazza, and Frank Thomas. I am drawing a blank. You 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 say Ty Cobb, and I'm like, well, maybe there's a Philly connection because Ty Cobb finished up his career with the Athletics. I have absolutely no idea. You have stumped me, Sully. Well, why don't you just use that as your guess? That's my guess. They have a Philly connection. Close. They all played their final major league game with the Athletics. Every single one of them. Wampum. That's wow. Ty Cobb finished with the Philadelphia A's. Satchel Page came back on a publicity stunt from Charlie O'Finley to pitch one game with the Kansas City A's. Billy Williams was acquired by Finley when he was a Cub legend, and the A's had won three straight World Series, and this was Billy Williams' chance to win a title. Joe Morgan, who had played for the Wheeze Kids when they read the reuniting of the Big Red Machine in Philadelphia, finished his career with the A's. Reggie Jackson came back and gave his curtain call with the A's. Mike Piazza, when he was wandering through the woods trying to find a team to play for, wound up playing with the A's to finish his, played his final game there. And Frank Thomas went back and forth between Toronto and Oakland at the end of his career. And his final game was with the A's. And Dick Allen, in the year after there was the great purge of stars, and the 77 A's were a terrible team, but they included a cameo from Dick Allen, and that's where he played his final game. So you, that's crazy. That's great. You when you saw that, I, I don't know what they are. I mean, I, maybe that's something to do with finishing with the Philadelphia A's. I was like, it, Philadelphia A's. You throw away the Phil. You were almost there. You were you were one one word away from that. So that's yeah. Crazy. And 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 in '77, Dick Allen finishes up with Oakland, and he wears a jersey. With the name, the nickname Wampum, which was his mm -hmm. hometown, Wampum, Pennsylvania, That's and right. number sixty, very weird number. Mm -hmm. I believe that is because he graduated high school in nineteen sixty. That's right. Well, there you go. Well, I, if you saw it, when, you, when I saw you do this, like that's the, the Mr. Radom is there. He's on the cusp. He's right at the so lip. close. He's at the lip. He's he's. I've got. He's, I, I had the bat on my shoulder. Nineteen two thousand six games. <laughs> I, sorry, Carlos Beltran. Your Beltran. Oh. You belt um, Oh, actually, I, I had a, I had a backup uh, um, A's trivia question, uh, and you being a man who knows his uniforms, um, the Oakland A's, the Oakland A's, not the Philadelphia A's, and not the Las Vegas, Portland, or whatever the word A's. Or, don't put a team in Las Vegas. Do we learn nothing from Miami and Phoenix? A city filled with transplanted people aren't going to embrace a team. They're going to stick to the team they grew up with. If you have to move them, move them to either Nashville or Portland or keep them in Oakland. But that's not the point. Okay. One other piece of Oakland A's trivia. The A's have won four World Series as the Oakland A's. And they have had a carousel of different uniform styles. What is the only color uniform top that they clinched a World Series with more than once. It would have to be white, I believe. You would be wrong. Well, 1989, I'm, now I'm going to extrapolate this whole okay, thing. Okay, that's, 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 that, that, I, I will allow you to extrapolate. I'll All right, so 89, the Earthquake World Series. Yep. Uh, so, you know, so 72, 73, 74, and then 1989. Right. Yep. What, what was it? Was it yellow or green? It was yellow. 
yellow. It was yellow. They clinched in 72 on the field in, in Cincinnati with a yellow uni. In 73 against the Mets, they were wearing dark green. 74 against Los Angeles, again yellow. In 89 in San Francisco with a road grace. Wow. 89, I remember watching the final out of that series, but I don't remember that it was in San Francisco, but I was in the Diamond Club at Shea Stadium. I was mm. at a Rolling Stones concert, and I weaseled my way into a uh, into an after party. I had was just the seen only the Stones game. play. That was the only good game in the series was game four. That was actually a competitive game. It was, it was, and I was in the Bay area at the time. It was just, it was just by the end, it was, there was no air in the balloon yeah. after the quake and everything like that. But, um, all right, well, look at, we did some trivia. We talked some show Walter and, um, we uh, determined that I proved that I'm a fan of Todd Radom's work because I complimented him forgetting that that was something that he designed. Look at that. Look what you did today. This is, this is, we're, we're winning, got, Sully. You know, we're winning. And we just won ugly. Hey, that sounds like a good name for a book. Todd Radom, where can people find your stuff? Buy your stuff. Put it on, put, put, wrap it up and put it under the tree. ToddRadom.com. It's my website. There's a shop in there. A little late for Christmas, but, Never. you know, you deserve something nice for the new year. We all deserve something nice given the state of the world. Hit me up on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Todd Radom, T-O-D-D-R-A-D-O-M. That's fantastic. And for everyone else, you can follow me. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter. I'm the Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Thanks so much again for making us your first listen. And we're available for free on all your podcasting platforms. You want a second listen? Have it be Locked on Bets, hosted by your boy Q, with expert analysis from Lee Sterling. Hey, Talking about hats, talking about bucks, talk the show Walter kind, talking about called third strikes, talking about green uniforms, and the end of careers of some of our great major league players. We're here at Locked On MLB with the great Todd Radom on the 18th day of December, 2021. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Todd Radom, what can people call me? Call you Sully. Everybody calls you Sully. That's right, even my mom. <laughs>